We do stand on the edge of a great new era, filled with both crisis and opportunity. An era to be characterized by achievement and by challenge. It is an area which calls for action and for the best efforts of all those who would test the unknown and the uncertain in every phase of human endeavor. It is a time for pathfinders and pioneers. of the world, and yet each year sees some 20 million people starve to death or die of hunger-related causes. All of the wars, revolutions, and murders of the last 150 years caused 60 million deaths. Today, hunger takes this toll every three years. Now, to me, this is unacceptable. In this film, some concerned and involved people are going to share with us their ideas on ending world hunger. We'll be discussing some of the basic facts about this issue and some of the solutions that are available. Back in 1961, when President Kennedy proposed that we put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, we really didn't know all that we needed to know to do that. His notion, however, was that if we could make an absolute commitment to that, we would in fact be able to get the job done. Many people have forgotten, but President Kennedy also said that ending hunger also deserve that kind of commitment. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required. Now it's interesting, we know a lot more about ending hunger than we did about getting to the moon, but we haven't made that commitment yet. And everyone that I've talked to agrees that we ought to. That ending hunger in the world is an idea whose time has come. We're doing this in many, many things. We put $30 billion into our, 30 more than $30 billion into our space program, which was a magnificent effort of engineering and technology and management and scientific uh, investigation and development. Whatever we want to do, and if we're willing to put the time and the resources to it, we'll get it done. The United States, uh, our Western European allies, the Japanese cannot live alone in affluence and have the rest of the world in poverty. Uh, it's to our own economic advantage to help those people in the 140 some less developed countries of the world. We'll be the beneficiary in the long run, but we'll also, uh, I think, live happier uh, if we are compassionate and generous. Ending hunger on earth is an idea whose time has come. And I think that with so many Americans traveling, uh, with mass communications letting us know what's going on uh, everywhere on the face of the globe, uh, I think we're beginning to sense a certain responsibility for the wealth and plenty that we enjoy and in a sense realize that uh, you know there but for the grace of God go I. We're not looking at television in this French and also John the Peace Corps age is no barrier. Well that was beginning of well hunger with me. Seeing uh, naked babies with big bellies and little legs who ate absolutely starving right before my eyes. 
one of the saddest cases I saw was a man outside who had twins. And he was giving everything they had, had a boy and a girl. He was giving everything they had to the boy. He was allowed something like a quarter of milk a week of half powdered milk and half water. And the girl was starving. How, what I did about that, I didn't want the milk, it was no sacrifice. I also had a quarter of milk a week. And I gave a, a social worker who would go out in the hills my quarter of milk to give to this one little girl. That was the only one. And there were thousands around. At the same time, we are preoccupied at this moment, many of us, I know the United States, Jamaica, many countries with the concept of human rights. My Prime Minister, Mr. Manley, said recently, human rights begins in the stomach of man. Well, I think that's true for 70% of the world. Uh, we take food very much for granted in the United States. But, uh, and for us, human rights means freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Uh, but for the majority of the people in the world, uh, the basic human right is the right to eat. Many so-called hard-bitten realists these days say that hunger is inevitable. It's always been throughout human history. I think they forget that the fact that 150 years ago, in the same way, slavery was considered inevitable. And we did something about that. We don't have slavery anymore. I think we can make that kind of moral judgment that it's no longer acceptable to have hunger in the world today. If I said to you, why is there hunger? You'd probably come up with an answer, much like most people would be. Well, there's too many people and there's not enough food. Sounds like a good answer, except that it's not true. The fact is there's enough food in this planet to feed eight billion people and we've got four billion, and yet every night about a half a billion go to bed hungry. In the United States, the most advanced country in the world, we've got enough food to feed a billion people. We've got 215 million, yet the government's own statistics show that 20 million Americans go to bed malnourished. This is translated into maybe one out of every four cans of dog and cat food, according to recent Senate testimony, is sold to old people who eat it themselves. Or of the six million retarded people in this country, half, three million, had malnourishment as a significant factor. Diet is critical to good health. And as we look forward, may I say, to uh, health insurance and uh, broader health programs, we need to look to preventing the medicine and we need to look to proper diet and proper nutrition. Therefore, we need to expand our school lunch programs. We need to have nutrition education in our schools. We need with our elderly people ways and means of delivering to many of them that are homebound, that are not in institutions, uh, uh, a, good, uh, a good nourishing meal a day, like Meals on Wheels, for example. And then now we have other programs under the Older Americans Act in which uh, uh, churches and schools, actually the school lunch program, serves meals uh, for the elderly in the community. But it still is minimal. We, you know, we really haven't done enough with it. We can conquer any kind of hunger in America with, a, with just a little more effort. It's just a matter of setting our minds to it again. I come right back to it. What this country wants to do, it can do. As somebody once said, if you can split an atom, and if you can put a man on the moon, you ought to be able to put a meal on the table. There are many things that we can and should do to end hunger in America. At the same time, we must commit ourselves to ending the unbelievable hunger and starvation in the rest of the world. I think that it's very important for us to realize that there's no reason why we can't act decisively to end hunger in America and around the rest of the world at the same time. If we are going to end hunger is going to have to become a high national priority, both for domestic kinds of hunger that I've talked about, malnutrition really, inadequate diet, and we're going to have to have a high priority internationally. We need almost a clarion call right from the president to the Congress, to the people. You know, we did this once before. After World War II, when Europe was literally starving, President Truman, called upon the American people, and particularly the American farmers, to empty their bins. And we took a great risk. We literally pulled down our reserve stocks 
to where we had less than a week of food supply left in this country. We depended upon the response of God Almighty to give us a good crop. And we had a big crop, interestingly enough. But we went around America and we literally scraped the wheat bins and the corn bins and the grain sorghum bins and we sent it in mass by shipload after shipload over to Europe. We had a commitment, we did it. The humanitarian commitments of this country to the hungry people of the world has certainly, I think, won us more friends uh, than all of the armaments and weapons we've spread around the world. Uh, people still look to us uh, remembering that when we were, they were hungry, uh, it was American generosity that fed them. The National Academy of Science's study on world food and nutrition says that in order to be prepared for a crisis, we need an adequate food reserve. In 1973 and 74, not having such a reserve resulted in hundreds of thousands of additional deaths by starvation. Now, this is important but it's even more important to know that millions of people starve every year even when there's not a food shortage. Somewhere between 500 million and a billion and a half people are hungry all the time. Now we must look at the causes of this constant hunger. The real answer to ending hunger is people feeding themselves. Throughout history, most people have been trying to feed themselves by making their living directly from the land as farmers. In fact, over half the people on the planet still make their living as farmers. Of the billion poorest people, most are peasants. Most work on land that's owned by somebody else. Uh, typically, half their crop gets paid to a landlord. And the grievances run very deep when you see food you've grown for your family carried off in a landlord's truck. It's not surprising that not only the problem of hunger, but the problem of violence on this planet is closely related to the grievances of the landless peasantry. You can see it in the peasant revolts uh, in Europe from feudal times until the 20th century. You can see it in the Russian Revolution, uh, Lenin's slogan of bread, land, and peace. And you can see it in Mao's revolution with his army of hungry landless peasants in China. You can see it in the Mexican Revolution, Zapata leading the peons in the quest for land. You can see it in Vietnam with uh, an army of landless, grievance-ridden peasants fighting for a generation. It's in the conditions of chaos and underdevelopment and poverty and a wide gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, that revolutionary and explosive uh, tensions emerge, which in our time inevitably will spill over to developed nations. We can end all this violence and begin the process that will end world hunger by giving the farmers what they want, effective control over their own land. Not only will they immediately have more to eat, but farmers who have control over their own land are motivated to make the labor-intensive sweat equity improvements that result in dramatic increases in productivity. We've got country after country in which we have demonstrated that when you really have land reform and you have a available farm credits and you have that outreach of farm technology, modern technology, like our county agent system, and you have these schools that, that educate our farm, that the farm people, and just basic fundamental things. When you do things like that, you get results. Now, when you start pouring your money in and you just say, well, we're going to help uh, agricultural production, and you pour it into the old land system with the absentee landlord, with the big feudal estates, you don't get it. What you really do is pouring money on the ground and it just doesn't produce the results. And there's a tremendous amount of corruption in it. If you take the, the, the business of the, the processes of development in a lot of countries, including Jamaica, have used in the past, what is called the trickle-down process. You build an industrial sector, you improve agriculture, you encourage tourism, mining if you have it, and somehow the blessings will trickle down uh, like the gentle rain, you know, upon the poor beneath, but it never does. Uh, there's an example in the Dominican Republic, which is a model that's operating all over Latin America, for example. 
Here's a country where there's 75% malnourishment. Three quarters of the people are malnourished. They have vast sugar exports. And yet this major American-based corporation in the last three years has brought up 9% more of the good food-growing cropland, converted it to sugar production with the uh, cooperation of the government there, which is not really worrying about the people, but rather their own, their own financial well-being, and created greater and greater sugar imports or exports out of that country into the United States. So here you have, on a simple-minded basis, it looks good. Okay, increased exports, increased well-being for people? No, it doesn't trickle down. People don't have the land to grow food. There's more hunger. I used to think I worked on the problem of world hunger as a professional analyst eight hours or ten hours a day, and then I just went home and lived my life without much thinking about my life. And then one day it hit me that during the, all the other hours of the day when I wasn't working on world hunger, what I really was doing in small ways, very small ways, was supporting world hunger or supporting the kinds of forces that I was analyzing in my professional life were causing world hunger. Uh, and those kinds of forces, at least insofar as I contacted them, were the, the kinds of things I bought and where they came from and what their effect was on world distribution of food, on world distribution of income, and on the way food is raised. that people often think of as the main cause of hunger is overpopulation. But when you look at why hungry people have so many children, the evidence points to it being the other way around. The main cause of overpopulation is hunger. Many people think that the population explosion that occurs in underdeveloped countries is because the people are dumb. They're overbreeding because they're ridiculous, stupid, uh, backward, whatever. The fact is, it makes economic sense, common sense sense for the people, say, in India, in a, in a, in a village in India, uh, to have as many children as possible. It takes 6.3 children to have one surviving male heir at age 21. Half of the children, the people in underdeveloped countries, die before they're six years old. I noticed uh, throughout my, my working period in Niger that women were constantly having children at two-year intervals, yet at the same time they did not, they could not account for all live children, all live births. I noticed that um, if a woman had had maybe ten children, at least four to six had died along the way before reaching, say, five years old. Also, that you see dramatic decreases in birth rate the minute the infant mortality rate goes down. In other words, the only time you can do sensible family planning is when your children are going to live. We in, the Ameri in America do family planning because if we have three kids, we know that they're going to live, or two kids, we know they're going to live on average till 70 years old. In these countries, you can't make those kind of decisions. The reason these kids die is hunger and hunger-related disease. You can't tell hungry people whose kids are dying to have fewer children because they need these children to work the land and to support them in their old age. As Professor Raj, one of our very eminent economists down in Kerala, has shown that in a state which is largely Christian, Catholic, and therefore you would assume that they are not uh, bending over backwards to practice family planning, in a state of that nature, you had a population rate dropping from 3 to 1 percent in a space of 10 or 15 years simply because education and medical facilities spread as wide as they could in the villages. unbelievable to me what it would cost to end hunger. Most experts agree that if the United States and other aid-giving countries were to spend only twice as much as they now spend on the kinds of programs that have worked, that we could end hunger for the world's poorest billion people in 20 years. 
for this to happen, the American people will have to make it clear that this is what they want. We need to remember this is our government and each of us can make a difference. Somehow we have to break down these old barriers of uh, distrust, inefficiency, mismanagement, and then you can get all the money that I think uh, is needed and necessary over a long period of time to solve the real problem, which is the poverty, the malnutrition of literally millions of people in underdeveloped or less developed countries in the world. But I think the, the greatest question is making the public aware of hunger. I was on this plane with all these congressmen and senators, and they asked me something about hunger. Not a one of them knew anything about it. Not a one. I, some of them, they, they won't let me for saying this. They just couldn't believe hunger. They said they don't know anybody who's hungry. And I've often asked myself, do our political leaders lead or do they follow? And I guess I've come to the conclusion that it's a little bit of each. And uh, they can't go very much faster than anybody else goes. And furthermore, everybody else can have some pushing effect on them. But it, again, it all goes together. And there's no way the political leaders are going to be way out where everyone else isn't. Because the whole basis of this society, a participatory democracy, the basis is that all of us, and not just going to be private citizens voting every two or four years, but public citizens, working on an ongoing basis to have an input on virtually everything. Ecology, hunger, defense, uh, our economy, all the basic questions. I think the American public, uh, and especially American young people, uh, can end hunger on Earth just as they ended racial segregation in the South in the early 60s, just as they ended the war in Vietnam in the early 70s. Uh, I think the agenda for action uh, for young America is to end hunger. And I'd like to see uh, my, my country and your country uh, take the, not only the moral leadership, but take the, the financial, the technological, the uh, scientific leadership in saying to the world, there shall be no more hunger. No child shall go to bed at night crying because of hunger. I just felt that uh it's, it's just not okay with me. I thought about the numbers of people dying, kids dying my age, older, because, you know, I can just imagine my parents dying. What, what, what would it be like if my family were dying if I was hungry? Because it could just as well be me or someone else. I, I'm a mom, and I have two children, and when my baby cries for her bottle, uh, I get her bottle. There's, there's no question about it. And... I really can't imagine having a baby and having my baby cry and not being able to feed it. It's all children are my children. And if, if they cry, my baby cries too. And all women, mothers, are my sisters. And if they can't feed their children, I can't feed mine either. I got involved in this issue because I found out that something can be done. We've learned, often unconsciously, to accept hunger as inevitable, but I think it's time to look at the facts. Hunger has been ended many places in our lifetime. There are proven solutions. We've just been looking at some of them. All it takes is for us to decide that we can do it, and it will be done. If each of us takes responsibility, not thinking it's hopeless and not waiting around for some bandwagon to jump onto, but if we can each take personal responsibility, doing whatever it is that he or she can do, then we will do this thing. We will rid this planet of hunger. And I rejoice in this vision, a vision of all of us working together to make the world work. And I'm grateful for the opportunity of working toward that end with you. Children of the sand.